Kiriaki, anything you want to add to this? Basically, say three awarenesses inspired from this conversation and also what Peter was bringing in and from what she pointed out. The one is the platonic notion of the wise king or the wise leader. So according to Plato, the ideal society in a way would be that people would be so wise and educated to be able to discern the wise king. So it would be the king, but it would be also a philosopher and really carry the vision of the future and uh, the ethos of, of how things should be. The problem nowadays that seems to appear also with the intervention of media, which makes it even more complicated, is that uh, the problems are so complicated that the simple people that don't have a specific education on, on uh, let's say, economics or uh, geopolitical issues, and let's say science issues, medical issues, uh, they are just carried away by what the media, the social media present. So we find ourselves unable to choose the right leader. And because we don't not know who or what they speak, but we don't understand what they're saying, or we don't even care because marketing plays a major role as well. So um, this is the one, the one uh, danger. The other danger is that the, as you said, the elite or maybe people that are more wise they are failing to present solutions. So there's great danger uh, because of many factors that we go into totalitarian and very nationalistic extreme uh, things prevailing because the elite, let's say, or the uh, more liberal side is failing to, 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 to offer other solutions. So we're going into very conservative environments. That there are dangers in this. Uh, of uh, missing the middle. And the other thing I want to say is that politics have become so polluted that uh, genuine people, or at least in Greece, which, which by the way, was a very, very, and is still a very politically orientated country. Uh, and, yet, and yet the young people are, are not getting into politics. They are disappointed. They, they from the corruption and the, from the lack of vision. So this is a very big problem. In the last elections, I happened to be in the office. Um, you know, one of the people that go to serve the elections. And I was wondering where are the young people? You know, all the old people were coming to vote <laughs> with their sticks, and I was wondering where are the young people? Why they not? why they're not voting, just to bring this in the picture. Yeah. yeah. So the, the last point you made there is the proof point that something is so uh, badly broken in that the catch-22 or the catch-66 or the catch-88 is the environment is so toxic that the people that could maybe bring the ideas to change the environment would never be crazy enough to enter that environment. So we looked at the first four spaces where we identify a stop situation, a, a, a blockage, a space that's critical for humanity's future. That if we are to find a way that is redemptive, and will offer sustainable, regenerative, co-creative future, those four spaces will have to be transformed. The economic space, the cultural, ethical leadership space will have to be transformed. People in power will have to embrace a, a new paradigm. I mean, easy for us to say, we'll have, but the will have spoken from the point of view of seeing something that is, that is intractable and cannot be solved within the same level of its current challenge, to again borrow the 
Einstein point of view. And thirdly, the area of politics, policy, and governance, and then media and social media, especially in the way it corrupted and polarized and removed the incentives from developing shared conversation, which brings us naturally is a segue to the next space. And the next space is, is again, me cheating and inserting three into one, the information, the knowledge, and the breakdown in sense-making. And in the first place, it's easy to see the, how social media corrupted or infused the information landscape with so much that's not reality-based. But I will propose that in terms of looking at the information and the knowledge and sense-making stop situation breakdown, it, it was actually the second wave problem. The first wave, I would assert with what I term the fallacy of the Google age. When Google was conceived in the mid to late 90s, the understanding was that we were quickly developing an internet that will connect all the world's information and knowledge and Google's mission was conceived as organize the world information and they couple that with a vision of have the entire world information and knowledge to an extent one click away, which by the way, having worked with companies on vision statements, vision statement is effective when you say something in one line that people can visualize. So that's a successful vision statement. It was very effective. But it created a fallacy. And the fallacy that it created was the idea that if you conflate easily information with knowledge, that all knowledge could indeed be one click away. And I love Google. We all love Google and the service it provides us. But the problem is that we now have generations of people that were raised into this idea that everything, everything you need to know, you can access online. And I defiantly disagree. And so I'm going to bastardize my process and show a loom within a loom um, and ask you to contribute from your experience and insight. I, I want to show five substrates of knowledge, five knowledge layers that cannot be accessed, cannot be recreated by Google or Wikipedia or any app. And that we quickly review this just to instantiate the idea that that is today a problem. Because, for example, knowledge that you will come to when you needed to work hard and you couldn't just do one click and access everything, that knowledge potentially is at risk for a whole generation of people, younger generations. Here are the five substrates of knowledge, five levels of knowledge, five kinds of knowledge. Experiential knowledge. What comes to mind when you hear experiential knowledge? And I'm saying that's a, that's a substrate of knowledge that you could not access on the internet. What, what's the first thing that comes to mind? See, I think about... as a young boy running free and roaming in the fields. I think about climbing trees and falling. I think about diving in the ocean. I think about playing hide and seek outdoor. Now, these days, in the age that we were playing those kind of things, 
a lot of youngsters play only computer games and the parents are happy because they believe they are developing skills that will make them very successful in the computing industry. It's great. I'm, I'm not against some games, but experiential knowledge is not something you could access on Google. And I will pose the following question. What are the chances of a young teenage boy, teenage girl, exploring and discovering the realms of romantic love and all that goes with that without having their minds corrupted before their own personal discovery and exploration with images that they will easily access online that could only make them feeling um, horribly inadequate. I'm not romanticizing going to the past. I'm not against the internet or against Google. I'm saying there is certain dimension of experiential knowledge that cannot be taken uh, away or should not be taken away and certainly cannot be replaced by Google. So I'll, I'll pause here, see if the idea of experiential knowledge resonates to you. And I, I intuit that as you will respond to that, you will already surface the other four substrates of knowledge that I listed. So let's see. Well, knowledge is not experience to start with. <clears throat> so experience is higher than knowledge. And uh, real life is what ones need to gain real experience. So in a way, knowledge is brain knowledge, or data knowledge, or reference knowledge. And it can be very clinical and void of any life. And uh, <clears throat> let's say the, the real physical, bodily, sensual experience. What else, um, Kiriaki or Peter or Rav Shalom, what else on experiential knowledge? You know what? Let me reveal the, the all five and we'll talk about them together. Character forming knowledge. When I was 11, 12, I used to get up uh, five mornings, two hours uh, before school at 5 a.m. to run. As I was a long distance runner. It was a character forming, character shaping knowledge, the discipline of that. It's a, it's a character infrastructure that I lean on today. So very much to do with what you are offering, Avshalom, there in the idea of real life experience is superior to knowledge. In this case, character forming knowledge. Third substrate, concentrated focusing and contemplative discovery kind of knowledge. Example of which we touched earlier with the idea of Marie Curie, um, Albert Einstein, some of the great philosophers, some of the great thought leaders in all spaces. These are people that took pains, tremendous pain and tremendous discipline and tremendous time to focus on something for a very long time, perhaps not in a meditative way, in a cave, although some did that too, but persisted with tremendous focus. The idea that you can just click away to everything defies the discipline of mind of staying with one thing for a long period of time. That's a problem because what if the challenges that we are now facing, they require the kind of focusing discipline, contemplative muscle from people to, to unlock the, the challenges that are, are in front of us. The fourth substrate is intuitive knowledge. Whatever happened to the non-linear, non-chronological, intuitive sense, sentimented guided, feeling guided, whatever other language you'll choose to describe the sixth sense. Very important part of knowledge, the idea that everything can be accessed on Google. Part of the risk, part of the danger is training people away from their intuition. And the fifth dimension, development knowledge. 
Okay, the, the, the idea that we can evolve, change our perspective, embrace new perspectives, embrace a new level of consciousness, a, a new dimension of consciousness that inside of which a whole new body of knowledge becomes available for us. So I'll pause there uh, in case any of these resonate and you'd want to build on this, and then we'll come back to just the loom of challenges we are facing if we are to approach the inquiry of humanity's future and the sense of unity. I would, I would say that one of the, I think, great lessons of life is that every, everything is a process that has a beginning, middle, Maybe it has an end, maybe it continues. Um, and that virtually anything you can think of will have that process. If you're new to something, you're gonna have the beginning and, um, and you have to grow into it. You have to run up against obstacles. You have to increase your um, breadth of knowledge about it. You have to add new information because you're stuck or whatever it is. And I, uh, you know, it's, I certainly would have loved when I was a young person to have been taught that, that the process of things is, is really everything. Everything that you will ever do, it will be a process. And, and, um, and the way you handle that process will determine some your successes and failures. And and it's a very simple idea, but it includes all these substrates that you're talking about, um, because you've got to you've got to handle things, you've got to look at them, you've got to touch them, you've got to experience them, you've got to uh, turn them around, turn them upside down, see what makes them break, see what um, all these things um, push the boundaries of of a subject, and and that's how you advance it in yourself, if not in the world. And uh, I think, yeah, the, the one, one click and go to Wikipedia and, and that's the end of it is a, is a uh, short circuiting of the most natural way of life. And uh, obviously detri detrimental, could be detrimental generationally. So yeah, it's a big, it's a big, big territory. You also are raising something that I didn't include in the 12 boxes, and maybe the most important one, given what you're describing, is to create a, a space for the blockage or the stop situation in the education system. Because if we are to have a new future, then education will have to be completely rerouted. If we are to have a, a uh, collaborative, safe, generative, creative future, you'd need to educate young generations with that premise in mind. And what we largely have in the education system is the paradigm that was developed when schools started. And schools started in a major way sometime after the Industrial Revolution when parents went to work in the factories and went to work in other places. And you needed to have a place to look after children. So what did you do? You sent the children into factories, factories, factories of knowledge. But those were oriented, although there were some wonderful education system, educational systems that were developed, the majority of the education system has been oriented to make the young proficient to succeed in the economical requirements of adult life. Well, what if the entire paradigm is, change, is changing and you need to have new kind of skills to create a sustainable future for humanity, education will have to change as well. So right there, uh, the 12 boxes were insufficient. We need to add the 13 box. Other thoughts about the substrates of, of knowledge, please. I'd like to say, at this point, that uh, this is a very hot issue, at least a, a daily hot issue in my family, <laughs> having two adults and daughters. And um, 
yeah, I'm trying to cope with uh, with uh, with it as many parents. It's causing a lot of problems because uh, it's causing attention deficit in many children and addiction and addiction with the this and now also all the education has gone online due to the quarantine. So also the education happens uh, through through the computers and you know. And uh, there are many things because also they miss the social life, as you say, the experience. Uh, but it, it went so much beyond control that it, we cannot uh, go back at the moment. We just need to find, uh, you know, they tried, they tried in uh, France uh, to ban the mobiles at schools. And um, in some schools, they, but, you know, all the books are going to e-books now. I mean, I remember when I was also like you, I was smelling the books or I was uh, discovering this poet uh, and uh, we, we were gathering with my friends in the square to, to read poets or to, to share songs. But uh, now the square is a uh, game or a... Uh, What's up? And uh, it's a different kind of uh, generation. They are born with uh, this. Uh, they are uh, very prone to image, uh, not so much to content, uh, not a lot of words. On the other hand, uh, they are very good in being uh, synthetic. So because they have all this information, they can suddenly cap come up with an amazing a compilation of thoughts and an amazing synthesis of information, which we couldn't. Um, and they, they, they perform in different ways. Like the other day, my, my, my daughter was sitting with a friend and they were not speaking. So I was saying, what, what were you doing? And, they, and she say, we were vibing together. We vibe together. So I said, oh, oh, that's interesting. Uh, I mean, a completely different way of, uh, of um, approaching uh, relationships. Yeah. Um, and it's interesting also because they, they have from very early, very exposed to a lot of knowledge, a lot of information. As you say, this has dangers, but also it has some positive sides. Absolutely. So, number one, we're not romanticizing the past and advertising it as better. Um, number two, we are not suggesting that there aren't many tremendous gifts with the internet. We are, number three, proposing that it is curious. I've had conversations with several engineers in Microsoft and in Google. Those people that know how those systems are wired, they keep their young children away from the screens majority of time and are very, very strategic in what they allow them to be exposed to or not. So they must know something about how those devices and programs are, are wired. But the last thing you, you're saying there, Kiriaki, is those, your two daughters, that generation, they come with new capabilities, with new software. They have what we believe that that generation will bring the software that will help address the kind of challenges that we are describing here. And the reason we are in this dialogue is we believe we have something to offer. We are absolutely certain they have something to offer and inform us. It, it is the idea that there has to be some cross-generational dialogue to help solve the huge challenges that we are describing here. Those challenges, those top situations re will require, are requiring multi-generational approach. And I'm beginning to propose one dimension of the loom of strategies.